Thank you so much for having me today and thank you for showing up. Our students usually don't show up for events like this, so I am so excited to see so many people in the audience. And you have a beautiful campus here. This is my first time visiting this campus and it is really, really uh, beautiful. Um, so my theme is um, your end is not where you start if you persevere. And since this is Black History Month, I will be telling you or talking about my own, very own history. I was born in a very small town called Chapel Hill, Texas. Actually, I was born in Sunny Stand, Texas. And if you look on the internet, I think it says a community with a church and a cemetery. That's pretty much it. Uh, Chapel Hill is a little larger than that. Um, my father was a sharecropper and he had a third grade education. And my mother, uh, she had a 10th grade education. Uh, we lived in a four room house, very much like the room that's on the um, screen. Uh, I'm from a family of 10, eight siblings and my parents. We grew up in a loving uh, household. Our parents inspired us to do well in school. At a very young age, I learned the importance of a strong work ethic. Can you hear me clearly or am I too close to the mic? Can you hear me? Put thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, again, my dad, he was a, he was a farmer and, uh, and he was also a carpenter. And being raised in an environment, we had to basically build everything. If a tractor broke down, of course we had to fix it. So we were extremely poor uh, during that time. But we learned to work very hard. My father would give us chores and we had to work up, wake up very early in the mornings and you know, take care of the farm. We didn't have running water, so we had well water, of course, so we had to go out and draw the feed, the horses, chickens, cows, all those things. So uh, being raised on that farm again, we had a very good uh, work ethics. So in 1970, we moved to Hempstead, Texas. Uh, that uh, city or town has a population of about 5,000, 5, okay? Very small town, but of course that was a move up from where I come from. Um, in my high school, we had about 80 students in my class. And um, in 1976, uh, when I was in the fourth grade, my oldest brother graduated from college. He graduated from Prairie View Adam University with a degree in electrical engineering. At that time, I pretty much knew that I wanted to be an electrical engineer. And the reason is because he would come home, he would be studying, I was seeing, that was during the time of a slide rule, and then uh, the calculator came out, and he showed me how to use the calculator and how to program that calculator. And of course, I was just adamant about becoming an engineer from that time on. He really showed us the value of excellence in education. All eight of my siblings went on to complete college, and six of us started out majoring in engineering. Um, so, um, when I was in high school, I'll go back to my high school days. I was a cheerleader, I played basketball, I ran track and field, very active, and I also graduated in the top 10% of my class. Uh, I, I, again, in our class, we had about 80 students, so um, locally, in Hempstead being the top 10% was really big, and people always thought I was smart. Um, <laughs> but to my surprise, being in the top 10% allowed me to get accepted to the University of Texas in Austin. <laughs> I laugh because um, when I left Hempstead, I received one scholarship in the amount of $300 from the women's club at the bank. And um, I went off to UT Austin to be the best engineer and walk in the shadows of my brother. So when I went to UT, it was so many people. I had never seen so many people <laughs> in one place. There are over 50,000 students there. Of course, you know, um, 
I would be in classrooms with, uh, and in my classroom, the, my classrooms were larger than my entire high school class. So it was very shocking, and um, it was a culture shock. And the first thing I realized is that I was not prepared. I was not prepared. I remember walking into my physics class, and I had a professor from MIT. His name was Dr. Scher. He wore tennis shoes. I'd never, I didn't think teachers wore tennis shoes. He had tennis shoes and a ponytail. And he started writing on the board, and the board looked very much like that on the first day of class. And I thought, oh my God, why am I here? That was when my tribulations really began. I had a tough time. I was struggling in both physics and chemistry, as well as calculus. I lost confidence. I began to doubt myself because I'd always made good grades. And when I left Hempstead, I was told I was very smart. And all of a sudden, here I am, the lowest, one of the lowest performers in the classroom. I was sitting next to children who were second, third, fourth generation. Their parents were faculty members. And they were making A's. And they were very confident. Um, I, I began to feel like I didn't belong at UT Austin. And I felt like everyone else was much, much smarter than me. I was kind of quiet, I'm still kind of quiet, and I felt isolated. And I was really shocked when I would see students go in and talk to the professors and have conversations with professors. I was always afraid of my professors. It was terrifying to go to office hours. I really didn't know that I was supposed to study in groups. I would stay up all night studying my physics. And, and he would give us six problems to solve, and I would get through three. <laughs> and because um, I worked alone in many cases. Um, so my grades started slipping. But I had to resort to being a problem solver. I had to realize that I was not academically prepared and I needed to put a plan together. I had to start by being honest to myself. I had to deal with the truth. And that was that my rural high school education did not prepare me to be a successful engineering student at UT Austin. I had to reinvent myself and I had to make sure that my skills were at the correct level and I had to close the gap in knowledge to build my confidence again. So I, of course, I called my brother, who was my mentor at the time, and he agreed to tutor me. We tutored over the phone, through the mail. On weekends, I would fly to Dallas, where he was working at the time for a company. And things started to turn around. As I approached my junior year at UT Austin, I went in to see my advisor. And he saw that I had passed physics and chemistry with the grade of a C. And he recommended that I change my major. My heart was broken. I'd worked very, very hard to get my grades up. I also, if you recall, I always wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to be an engineer since the fourth grade. But I decided I wouldn't give up. I would persevere. So I transferred from UT Austin to UT Arlington. I moved closer to family. And by the way, while I was at UT, I did work. I had to work at the mall to support myself. Remember, I only had that $300 scholarship. So it was very challenging from every aspect. So I decided to transfer to UT Arlington. And when I transferred, I was able to live with my sister. So I no longer had the financial burden of housing. And I also took advantage of being close to my brother who could tutor me and help me get through engineering. By the time I started taking those junior level classes at UT Arlington, I had become a better student. And when I 
moved into my senior year, I took a course called Electromagnetic Field Theory. And my professor was Dr. Olivey. And you can see his picture on the screen. He still looks like that today. He graduated from MIT, extremely sharp, sharp, sharp uh, professor. And we were all afraid of his course, Electromagnetic Field Theory. But I worked very, very hard, and I made mostly A's in that class. And I recall um, him returning on an exam. And of course, I was the only African American in the class, and there were only two females in the class. This was a class of about 100 students. And when he returned the exam, he said, Pamela, I need you to come to my office. Oh my God. I thought, what could he possibly want with me? Oh, I thought, maybe he thought I cheated. I'm not quite sure. So after class, he walks very fast. He's very tall, very straight. And he walked down the hall, and I followed him. And we went into his office. And near his window, he had a magazine, a journal article. And he walked over to that journal article, and he said, you see this guy? I said, yes, sir. He said, this was my best friend at MIT. It was an African-American guy. He said, he's really, really sharp. He said, I think you're a bright student. You should pursue your master's degree. Oh my God, I was so relieved. <laughs> I said, oh, thank you so much. Uh, I think I'll try to do that. But anyway, so I finally graduated from UT Arlington with relatively good grades. And right upon my graduation, my father got, became very ill back in Hempstead, Texas. And I'm close to the youngest of eight, so of course the family says, Pam, you don't have a job yet, so why don't you go back and take care of my dad? My mother wasn't around at the time. And so I moved back to Hempstead. So my next point, my first point was, first of all, I had to be honest to myself while I was at UT and realize that I had weaknesses and work on those weaknesses. The second thing that I had to do is I had to uh, become a problem solver and find a way to stay in engineering and not leave the profession. So I transferred schools, found a way to survive financially and to obtain a degree. And the third thing that I had to do is I had to, or someone had to show up in my life to tell me or to help me to build my confidence, to reinforce it. And my oldest brother would always tell me, Pam, when you're ready, a teacher will appear. And I really do believe Dr. Olivey was that teacher who appeared, who pushed me to help me move into um, believing in myself so I could go to the next level. So when I came home to Hempstead, it's very close by Prairie View Adam University. I decided I would go on to pursue that master's degree. And that's when I met my second mentor, Dr. Fuller. When I came into the program, he said um, I wanted to do research. And I liked space. I liked space a lot. And he was working on a project from NASA. He was doing a project that was called uh, the Radiation Impact on Memory Devices. And we were bombarding them with various types of radiation to find out uh, how these electronic devices would behave in space. Very, very exciting project. So I did my master's thesis in that area. But during that time, I had an opportunity to travel, to go to the University of Maryland, and go to the Physics Institute in, in California. And so I had a, an, an opportunity to expand and grow. And so when I came back, from conducting my research, we ended up publishing a few papers on this. And uh, Dr. Fuller said, he called me by my maiden name, which is Holland. He said, Holland, you're smart. You should pursue a PhD. I didn't know what a PhD was. And I said, uh, he said, there may be some opportunities at Texas A&M, and uh, you should go and seek those opportunities. And I thought, OK. And um, so. Dr. Fuller uh, and I, they helped me to uh, get admitted into Texas A&M. 
I didn't know what a statement was. You know, if you, have, you have to have those statements. I think I wrote on my statement, I just want to be an expert or something like that. You know, actually in those statements, you should know a professor that you want to work with and, you know, you should do your homework. I didn't. But anyway, I was fortunate enough to get accepted into Texas A&M. And that's when my next teacher appeared. Uh, it was Karen Watson. She was my advisor and mentor at Texas A&M. It was a wonderful experience, and we continued. Uh, I finally completed my PhD there at Texas A&M, and uh, once I completed that, I went to the Rochester, of Institute, of, Rochester Institute of Technology. I taught there for about two years, and I taught a course at Texas A&M. Then I went on to work at the Johnson Space Center because much, much of my research was in the area of the impact of radiation on electronic devices. So I had the opportunity to work at the Johnson Space Center uh, and to work on the shuttle. So very excited about that work. And then after two years of being there, I decided to um, come back to teach at Prairie View. And it was a wonderful opportunity. Um, while there, I had the opportunity to conduct research with Dr. Ken Wise, who was well, well, well known even in Japan and all over the world for his work in microelectronics. And he became a mentor. And so um, he mentored me through the process and I became a, an assistant professor at Prairie View and then a full professor. And then I became the department head of the electrical engineering department at Prairie View Adam University, first female. Um, actually, I was the first African-American female in the department. So very excited about what happened there. And then, just traveling through my life, um, in 2018, the Ruth Simmons became the president of Prairie View Adam University. And many of you may not know who Ruth Simmons is, but Ruth Simmons is the first African-American to lead an Ivory League university. She was the president of Brown University for a very long time. Provost at Princeton, a president at Smith University, started the first engineering program. She is an icon in academia. And I am just so pleased to have the honor to work under her as her dean. I've learned so much from her along my journey. So, now, in summary, now that I've become the dean, we are now the number one producer of African-American males with degrees in engineering in the United States. We are the number three producer of African-American females with engineering degrees. We, just this year, the mechanical engineering program was uh, named the number one best college in mechanical engineering in te Texas based on highest salaries according to Campus Rio. We now bring in about $70 million of research funding, and we have improved our ranking, ranking in, the United, in the U.S. Uh, News World Report by 30%. We rank in the top 30% of the engineering colleges in the U.S., and our chemical engineering program is ranked number six in the state of Texas. So we're very happy. I've had a chance to produce my first technical book, Power Systems and Operations and Controls, and I'm just very excited about uh, where my future may be. But my whole point is, and the story of my life, and what I want to share with this room today, and if there are any students who are struggling, of course life is full of struggles. Your struggle may not be the same struggle as I have. We have everyone has some type of struggle. Here are some keys that I've learned. You have to be confident. But in order to build the confidence, you have to work on it by improving your skills, especially in academia, by improving your skills and closing your knowledge gap. You have to be very honest to yourself and close that gap. You may have to sacrifice time, energy, and sleep. I can't tell you how many nights I've been staying awake, but anyway. Uh, and then you have to reinvent yourself daily and adapt. You have to desire the opportunity. Uh, desire to use every opportunity as a learning opportunity. Even when I went to Prairie View, I had to use that to take care of my father. 
I had to use that as a learning opportunity. And then be persistent in finding solutions, find sound solutions that actually work. Always be thirsty to learn more and have the courage to follow your heart. You know, if I would listened to my first advisor at UT, I would never have received the PhD in electrical engineering and be here standing in front of you today. So I'm gonna leave you with a story. You've probably heard the story before, but I wanna leave you with this story. It's called The Seed. Have you heard the story before? Hands? Nope. Okay. A successful businessman was growing old and knew it was time to choose a successor to take over the business. Instead of choosing one of his directors or his children, he decided to do something different. He called the young executives in his company together. He said, it is time for me to step down and choose the next CEO. And I have decided to choose one of you. The young executives were shocked, but the boss continued, I'm going to give each one of you a seed today, one very special seed. I want you to plant the seed, water it, and come back here one year from today with what you have grown from the seed and I have get, that I have given you. I will then judge the plants that you bring and the one I choose will be the next CEO. One man named Jim was there that day and he, like the others, received a seed. He went home and excitedly told his wife the story. She helped him, she helped him get a pot, soil and compost and he planted the seed. Okay, and I just dropped my paper. <laughs> and he planted the seed. Every day he would water it and watch to see if it had grown. After about three weeks, some of the other executives began to talk about their seeds and the plants that were beginning to grow. Jim kept checking his seed, but nothing ever grew. Three weeks, four weeks, Five weeks went by, still nothing. By now, others were talking about their plants. But Jim didn't have a plant, and he felt like a failure. Six months went by, still nothing in Jim's pot. He just knew he had killed his seed. Everyone had trees and tall plants. He had nothing. Jim didn't say anything to his colleagues. However, he just kept watering and fertilizing the soil. He so wanted that seed to grow. A year finally went by and all the young executives of the company brought their plants to the CEO for inspection. Jim told his wife that he wasn't going to take an empty pot, but she asked him to be honest about what happened. Jim felt sick to the stomach. It was going to be the most embarrassing moment of his life. But he knew his wife was right. He took his empty pot to the boardroom. When Jim arrived, he was amazed at the variety of plants grown by the other executives. They were beautiful, all shapes and sizes. Jim put his empty pot on the floor and many of his colleagues laughed. A few felt sorry for him. When the CEO arrived, he surveyed the room and greeted his young executives. Jim just tried to hide in the back. My, what great plants, trees, and flowers you have grown, said the CEO. Today, one of you will be appointed the next CEO. All of a sudden, the CEO spotted Jim at the back of the room with his empty pot. He ordered the financial director to bring him to the front. Jim was terrified, he thought. The CEO knows that I'm a failure. Maybe he'll have me fired. When Jim got to the front, the CEO asked him what had happened to his seed. 
Jim told him the story. The CEO asked everyone to sit down except Jim. He looked at Jim and then announced to the young executives, behold, your chief executive officer, his name is Jim. Jim couldn't believe it. Jim didn't even grow his seed. How could he be the, the new CEO? The other said. Then Jim said, then the CEO said, one year ago today, I gave everyone in this room a seed. I told you to take the seed, plant it, water it, and bring, bring it back to me today. But I gave you all boil seeds. They were dead. It was not possible for them to grow. All of you, except Jim, have brought me trees and plants and flowers. When you found that the seed would not grow, you substituted another seed for the one I gave you. Jim was the only one with the courage and honesty to bring me a pot with a seed in it. Therefore, here's the one who will be the new chief executive officer. So the takeaway from this, and even from my story is, don't let the noise of others, opinions, drown out your inner voice. Don't compare your life to other people, to thine own self, be true. Thank you. I did not pick any of my mentors. It's, you know, as my brother would say, um, he told me, he said, when it's time to learn, a teacher will appear. What that really, really means is when you're ready to accept what people are giving you, that person will be there. And that's what happened to me along my journey. Um, when it came time for me to probably pursue a master's degree that I did not know that I was going to pursue, then Dr. Olivey came and encouraged that. So they, they kind of appear, but they're already there. <laughs> it's that you just start accepting what they're saying. You're getting there. Okay, so I am at Prairie View, and Prairie View Anim University is a historically black college or university. And um, HBCUs, um, we have a, a lot of great programs at HBCUs, and a lot of people misunderstand HBCUs. They think because someone is attending a uh, historically black college or university that it is subpar. And what they don't realize is that uh, many HBCUs, they're all ABET accredited, just as all the other schools. If you look at our faculty, and, and according, uh, you know, our faculty in terms, especially in engineering, they look just like the faculty at other universities. And uh, so it is a place where students uh, who were probably like me, with a very low income, and uh, who, well, where people understand you, and a lot of nurturing occurs during uh, that uh, while you're attending HBCUs. Um, one of the things, if you notice, that when I went to go pursue my master's degree, I had the opportunity to work with cutting edge research with NASA. If you look at our HBCU right now, I'm going to use this opportunity to give a plug for my university so I can recruit some of you all. Um, we just invested $40 million into our research laboratories. We have a stellar, stellar uh, AI laboratory. It's an um, Air Force Research Laboratory that's uh, uh, valued at about $6 million. They do cutting edge research in AI. They write algorithms for quantum computing. They work with a team from MIT on their high performance computers. And our PhD students who graduate from that program, they actually, we have two that teach at MIT. It's a stellar, stellar program. We also have a $7 million cybersecurity center. We have a smart grid research center. We have so many outstanding things at our historically black college uh, that many of you guys probably do not even know about. It is not a subpar education. It is a state-of-the-art education. And what we're seeing is the de demographics at our university is changing because a lot of students are now becoming aware of some of the things that are happening. And they're looking at some of the, um, the workforce initiatives that are happening. And so um, 
We have a very good, uh, diverse population at our university, and we're very proud of it. Well, Dr. Karen Watson, the one from Texas a and I actually invited her to speak at Prairie View, and she did in the College of Engineering. Um, she was stellar, of course. And uh, I work with Dr. Fuller. We do quite a bit of research now uh, in artificial intelligence, machine learning in that space, and also field gate programmable devices. And Dr. Ken Wise, I, I haven't seen him. But he, I can't wait. I hope I can see him. He retired from University of Michigan at, at Ann Arbor. I, I, I would love to see him. Oh, absolutely, because as I walk through the hallway, I see so many students who are just like me. They, they're coming, and they're figuring it out, and they, they often don't have money, and you can tell when they walk up. So I often try to mentor our students. As a matter of fact, um, while serving as dean, I think our female graduation rate has increased by 28%. Uh, okay, being a female, but no, nothing against the men now, because we are, we are the number one producer of African-American males in the nation. So, But uh, we, I, I do, mentoring is very, very important to me. Yes, of course, like most universities, even when I was at Texas A&M, we had uh, organizations for female engineers. So we have a Society of Women Engineering Engineers, and it's a very strong organization. We also have Women in STEM. Uh, it's a very strong organization as well. Very active. We have SHIP, uh, the Hispanic organization, very active on our campus. We also have NSBE. It is the largest in the nation and the most active. Our, our chapter just won the um, national um, most active organization. So we're very active uh, in our college in engineering. We also have IEEE, your professional organizations as well. So her question was, what type of advice would I give a young person um, who was pushing through life, through, through, I'm assuming academia as well, trying to get an education? And I would say, it's very, very important, number one, be very honest with yourself and do not compare yourself to other people because we're not at the same, you're, you're not at the same place in your life as someone else. For example, my children were second generation education and I made sure when they were born they had books all over the floor. <laughs> and they were very, very well prepared for uh, college. But I have neighbors who never really, their parents never really had books around. But does that mean that my children have a better IQ than their, my neighbor? No. So do not compare yourself to anyone else and your journey is your journey. But there will come a time when opportunity will meet preparation. So you need to make sure that you build your skills and you become uh, you, you'd be the be very best human being you can be, both academically and, I guess, from, a, from an ethical perspective. Because you will meet opportunity. Just be prepared. So Prairie <coughs> University has over 9,000 students. Uh, of course, we have, we're very, very excited to be under the leadership of, of Dr. Simmons. Uh, we have eight colleges. We have a School of Architecture. I don't know if you've read it. You can look it up on your phone. Prairie and School of Architecture, number one in the nation in graduating uh, students of color, number one. Uh, stellar, stellar. The, the leader there is Dr. Sabani. She graduated from Rice, but she brings in some of the best architects in the world to teach in her college. So architecture is very strong. We have the School of Business. I'm really jealous of the School of Business right now because the engineering used to be number two in terms of the number of students at Prairie View, and they just surpassed us. They have 1,600 students. We only have 1,200. Um, but they are, they just had, uh, I think Janet Yellen come and speak to their business school. Uh, they have lots of great speakers and always have opportunities. They work, they get jobs at Bloomberg and Sachs and all those different areas. They're all in New York. I say, you know, I want to borrow some money from you guys. But uh, the business school is very, very stellar. 
And then, of course, there's the Juvenile Justice, School of Juvenile Justice. It has a doctoral program. By the way, the business school now has a doctoral program as well. And in the Juvenile Justice, the only one in the nation that focuses on psychology of juveniles, the only school in the nation. And uh, it has a PhD, a doctoral program there. And uh, it's very, very stellar. Of course, they have courts from Waller County in that space in their building, so they learn a lot. And then there's the School of um, Agriculture. We have a huge goat farm, huge, huge goat farm. And uh, they do quite a bit in that area, of course. Uh, a lot of our students go on to Texas A&M to their veterinary school and, and get their, I guess, vet degrees. Uh, and uh, so very, very stellar agriculture program. And then, of course, there's the College of Engineering, the Roy G. Perry College of Engineering. And we're so excited because we're about to move into our new $70 million research building and it costs more than the football stadium. So it is the most expensive building on campus. That goes to show you that uh, engineering is probably the signature program. But there's another signature program, which is nursing, and it's located downtown Houston. But 97% um, of the nurses pass their state board the first time. And I believe the national average is 65% but at our school, 97%. Lots of rigor, lots of rigor in our programs. Yeah, no, they started out majoring in engineering, so that's a story. So remember, when I went to UT Austin, I was in the top 6%. I only got top 10%, a little $300 scholarship. Well, my sister, who was much, much smarter than me, she was valedictorian of her class, and she got a full ride. So. Of course, she was able to do much better than me because she didn't have a financial burden. She didn't have to go work at the mall and so forth, right? Okay, I did. So I had to transfer. <laughs> and then um, I had another brother who went to Texas A&M, and uh, he started out majoring in engineering, but he played football. And as a matter of fact, he's a Texas A&M Hall of Famer, and he played in the NFL for seven, eight years, and he's coached now for about 30 years. He was a linebacker coach for the 49ers. I don't know if you watched that game, but anyway, he chose football. He got out of engineering, made a whole lot more money than me. <laughs> He's younger than me, too. And the others remained in engineering. My sister is a, a division chief at NASA, and my other brothers are work for Nokia. You know, I really think it goes back to our childhood. Let me go take you back to this picture right there, okay. So it, I think it started from here because we were raised on a farm. And on that farm, um, innovation was everything. I mean, you know, um, everything you did. My mother even made us dolls out of corn. <laughs> if a wagon broke, you fixed it. If a radio broke, you fixed it. You know, you looked at the tubes, you did all those things. And I think all of us, and my father was a carpenter, he was a sharecropper slash carpenter, and he paid attention to, attention to detail. I mean, he would build cabinets, and he had a very good reputation in our little small town. It, everyone wanted him to build things because he, would, he wanted everything very straight. And I think that technical mindset just pushed us in that direction. Great, great news. Uh, for Prairie View Adam University, two things actually. Uh, their Campus Rio just uh, rated all of the uh, mechanical engineering programs in the state of Texas based on salary, and Prairie View Adam University's uh, mechanical engineers are considered the best. Um, they have the highest salary in the state of Texas with a salary, average salary of $75,000 a year. And number two was Texas A&M. Number four was UT somewhere. But per, we, we have a stellar program. We have, our, our engineers are, are, are played very well. And that just came out recently. So we're very excited about that. But the second big thing is that our congressman just uh, announced that we have a $40 million transportation center. It's a national transportation center 
that we will house in our College of Engineering. And so we're very excited about that National Transportation Center. It's an inter multidisciplinary center, of course, our electrical engineers, uh, computer science, civil engineers, um, chemical engineers are all a part of that center. But um, yeah, very excited about the cutting edge research that's occurring there. And very excited about that announcement. It should be in the newspaper if you look it up on your phone. You know, you guys are really smart because I, I have a son about your age or maybe somewhere. And every time I say something, he's always on his phone. Oh, mom, uh, no, that, you're, you're not exactly right. So you can check me. <laughs> we just, we're very excited. The chancellor of Texas A&M just announced it. Okay. So can we get uh, Dr. Obiola on his side? Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more content from LSC Kingwood.